Well, if your season sucked or sucks because we're still in it for a lot of you right now. So you can change that up there. Man, there's so much you can do. You know, what I love about this channel are all the comments. You get comments from people that have been hunting 40 years, 50 years, and they talk about, you know, started watching the videos two years ago and it's changed how I hunt for the rest of my life. Shot my biggest, biggest buck. We're seeing our best bucks. We're seeing our best deer herd. And I appreciate all that. And, you know, sometimes it, I get a little bit, uh, I don't say, I, I get disappointed sometimes. We'll just put it that way. Because I'll see people that will comment occasionally that this channel is all about whitetails. Well, it is called Whitetail Habitat Solution, but we have pollinator blends. We talk about grasses, rabbits, pheasants. We talk about those indicator species of pheasants, rabbits, that if you have a lot of pheasants, rabbits, grouse on your property, which we do here, then that's indicative of a great whitetail property. And uh, you can't have one without the other typically. But bottom line is, you know, there's so much you do right now and you can turn it around in one year. This is not something that takes four years or three years. If, if, if it does, um, I would say you're doing something wrong because there are those cases, one out of 20, one out of 15, where it is going to take a few years because you have open cover. But even then you can use switchgrass that comes in in two years. Depends on the circumstances, but very rarely, let's put it that way, does it take two, three, four years to turn things around. You can turn it around right now. And you can turn it around, especially when I talk about number one here, change is good. Leasing, buying, scouting, meaning scout somewhere else on public land. Consider leasing some property, consider buying it. Buying is a huge uh, expenditure of resources, time and money. It takes a lot less to manage a public land hunt. People don't realize, I, I see public land hunters, they'll say, oh, they, they hunt private land. You don't realize on private land how hard it is to do it and do it well every single year. Because when you mess up on, on private land, you can't go somewhere else. Public land, most public land spots I go to, like in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, I'm hunting tens of thousands of acres. I can go two miles away, five miles away, 10 miles away in some cases and go find another spot. And if I put in enough boot time scouting, which is a lot less work than food plots, water holes, mock scrapes, timber cuttings, plantings, managing switchgrass, mowing, cutting, chemical, herbicide treatments, just scouting, a lot easier. Trust me, trust me on this one. But bottom line is, scout more, buy something, lease something. And for those of you that uh, don't care about leasing, or I, I hear people about that get mad at people to lease, it's because they've hunted private land that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars for free in the past, they expect it to be free. And when someone leases it out from under them for a few thousand a year, they get mad. That's ridiculous. But if someone buys it for 400,000, they're okay with that. Think about that. It doesn't make any sense, but that's the mentality. Always used to hunt this for free. Now they lease it out to hunters and uh, I can't hunt it anymore. So I don't like leave people at lease. Ridiculous. Think about it. Leasing is a poor man's way of hunting private land. You typically can lease per year, per year for about 1 25th, 1 30th. We're talking two, 3%, 4% of the overall value of the land. Think about that. Leasing is just a tiny minuscule fraction of what it costs to actually own that land. Play with the numbers. Look how much you can lease land for. You know, a parcel that might be worth literally $800,000. People lease for $8,000 a year. Okay, just incredible. It's 1% right there. But your monthly payments are often just a small, tiny fraction of what it costs to actually own. So there's a lot of land that people lease that can never afford to own that land. And so it is a viable option for, you know, like I said, it's a poor man's way to hunt private land. You know, knocking on doors, getting permission for free, that's fleeting. It, it will never last. But bottom line is if you're on public land, you don't like where you're hunting, change it. Go find a different spot because I see it all the time. You know, more and more people are hunting private land. That's not what I see, or public land. That's not what I see. You see in the northern areas where people used to go to and have these big hunting camps are gone. We used to have tent camps up in the UP by us. They're gone. The bars used to be hopping during gun season back in the 80s and 90s. They're gone. Those bars are closed. You used to have ladies night on opening night at a bar, you know, 80s, 90s up in Munising. It'd be literally 200 women in there because all the men are out at deer camp somewhere and just a you know, few guys, local hunters that come in there from out of town. It's all done now because people aren't coming into these small towns and areas to hunt to that high of a degree. There's so much great quality public land that we see next to private landowners in just about every state we work. It is incredible how these private landowners, we've never seen another hunter. Or we see one during gun season here and there. We saw a car parked down the road. 
it's ridiculous how many pieces of public land there are that are very, very unpressured. But you have to just go spend the, the time to find it and expect to change. Change is good. Number two, unpressured food and cover. Whether you're creating that unpressured food and cover on your land or you're finding it on public. The thing about public, it's always changing. So white oaks that were good in September, that area might be really bad in early October, mid-October because they're changing to red oak acorns because they drop later. And if other hunters are hunting there, they maybe need to hunt adjacent, really thick cover and clear cuts. Clear cuts are a great food source. Clear cuts in northern property, northern areas, can be like a cornfield down south. The difference is, is those clear cuts up north, they might be good for eight to 10 years because the hardwood regeneration grows slower. Aspen grows faster. So that browse gets above deer head high and changes more quickly. So a great place you hunting on public land relating to a clear cut could be completely devoid of deer four years later, two years later, just because they move on to another clear cut. And they're, they're more nomadic on big public land pieces. They'll go three or four miles. So look for that. We've seen that. You see it all the time. But on private land, build it. If you don't have quality food and quality cover, they're not going to stick around. And if you have quality food, I mean food plots. You can't rely on ag. You can't rely on habitat management, quote, habitat management. TSI, timber stand improvement. Really cool words in the scientific community. But if you're not putting in a quality food plot on private land, just go hunt public land. Because your neighbor down the road, once they do that, you're not gonna have any deer. Hopefully someone that contacts us, hires us, we'll show them how to do it. We'll show them how to take your deer away or the people that are watching this channel right here because you have to have quality food on private land. I wouldn't even consider leasing a private land piece. It isn't a good piece if you can't put food plots on it. And I'm not saying food plots are the end all be all, but that is the food source that time of year. And if you don't have the food, and you don't leave it unpressured, then you're not gonna see that deer herd because those just go find that. Now the does and fawns, they might stick around a little bit, but those mature bucks, they are willing to travel several times further than doe family groups to find that quality food and they will, and they'll be gone. And they'll be gone for the season. You just wonder where they're at and they'll come back occasionally during the rut here and there, but that's not a good property. You know, we're talking about your season suck because you didn't see much. We wanna make sure you have consistent draw every single day. You know, I sat out last night, it was November 27th, it's after Three weeks of gun season here in Minnesota. Had Lucky, our five-year-old, four, four, four or five-year-old Dylan. Lucky, he's five. Okay, he's Dylan's five. like, are you 100% sure or 95? I, I, I'm solid, he's at least five. Yeah. So I saw him the other day and hopefully Dylan, I need to get these videos to Dylan, so hopefully he's showing this right now, but the um, Lucky, when you look at him, he's a huge body. And I, and I saw him again last night. I passed him at 10 yards, passed him at 35 yards. 10 yards with a bow, 35 yards with muzzle loader, and again last night, 35 yards or 120 yards with muzzle loader. And he went through time three weeks into gun season. I'm still watching a five year old buck and able to pass him, whether he's four or five, regardless. But really want to see what he does next year. He hasn't done much for three years. So, bottom line is though, you can build that on private land, but you have to build it. So, start thinking about that. How can you put food here that's hidden? And that'll relate to these bedding areas. And how do we make sure that we assemble a stand combination around these areas where you're not spooking out that movement? That is critical. You can have multiple movements on a property. We have quite a few large food sources out here that we draw deer in and support different areas. But if your cover is not supported by quality food, then that cover is dead. You might have a few does, young bucks hanging around, but that's about it. Public land, it's always changing. Know that you're gonna slant more towards clear cuts and diversity towards December, meaning swamp edge, hardwood edge, where hills meet valleys, where you have that elevation change, where you have that, um, that change in habitat, young versus old type of habitat. Again, what kind of story does that area tell? If it tells you that there's elevation change, elevation and water change, high land meeting low land, young timber versus old type of timber and habitat. If all those things are coming together, it paints a really pretty picture of the potential of the area. And as you go into November and December in those remote areas, that's where you're gonna find those bucks. Might be those acorns dropping in September and October. Might be a random apple tree that you find, an old homestead or something. But bottom line is you need to change a lot more often because on private land, you can set the table for the whole year. If anyone's telling you, oh, I'm gonna set this up for a November hunt, that's a very bad thing. I wanna see you be able to enjoy the entire season. Don't blame others. That's what a lot of people start doing now. They just get crabby. I'm gonna blame the DNR because they gave you someone like dough permits. Well, don't use them. It's easy to build a dough herd on your property 
and let them stay there and be protected, even if your neighbors are shooting everything they see. In fact, it's easier because your neighbors are shooting everything they see. The deer don't go over there. Easy to stockpile deer on your property, especially does and fawns, and build that herd by just not shooting deer and providing unpressured food and cover. Just leave it alone. Those deer, pretty, they wise up pretty quick. We need to be here during the daylight and not here. That could be a fence line, 40 acres to 40 acres, and they know what's going on. They know how to do that. Give deer a little bit more credit to, for finding those unpressured holes. Don't blame your equipment. If you had equipment failures, you didn't find your deer this year, don't blame the equipment. I have a good friend right now that's telling me about a buck. He isn't, he's not blaming his equipment, but he messed up on a deer last night that he's been hunting all season. He's not blaming the equipment. I messed up on a big buck, the one I'm after in Wisconsin, a six-year-old. I messed up on him twice big time now because when he was four, I wounded him. And now when he's six, I hit a branch that I didn't know was there. So you can mess up, but what I'm not doing is saying, man, if I would have had a different, if I would have had a heavy arrow, it would have worked. If I would have had a lighter arrow, it would have worked. If I would have had a better sight, if I would have had better whatever. We all need to be familiar with our tools we're using with equipment, but it's not the equipment. The amount of dollars you have. We teach people all the time how to plant food plots with a backpack sprayer. Very minimal cost. You know, a few hundred dollars, you can plant several acres if you're doing it more labor intensive in your area. So you can do that. You don't have to have an even an ATV, ATV sprayer. You certainly don't have to have a tractor. We show that and prove that every single year. Not the tractors are bad. I like having a tractor to brush hog, mow my switchgrass, mow our lawn. That's what I use them for. Not having quality land, again, Get on your boots. Go find a better spot on public land that has unpressured food and cover. Just put some more boot on it. Have eight or nine spots in the back of your head. You know, and this is for the person that's passionate, that's doing, you know, whitetail is their main thing they do. Because there's people out there, you only devote five or six days to hunting a year, 10 days. Well, you, you, you kind of get what you put into it. And, and I know those people, most of them aren't expecting great things because they know they're not putting that time or money or effort or resources into it, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We talked, Dylan and I were talking about, you know, um, managing your scent, world's dumbest deer hunting that doesn't manage their scent when they're on stand. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people that they hunt four or five times a year, they have one stand and where they hunt. And by all means, then I just go out and hunt. I don't even look at the weather. When you have a day off, just go hunt. That's different. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how to improve your hunt. You're disappointed. You want to change. You want change. And uh, and if you if you only have five days to hunt, and you're disappointed. You know, find a new spot to hunt. Put some boot time in. Find some public land somewhere. But let's face it. If you're devoting five or six days a year, you can't expect a lot. You know, some of us are putting dozens of days in of work to get what we have, and we certainly do here. Do the opposite. It's an interesting one. If you live by cable TV and the hunting shows and you're watching someone sit in a blind out in the middle of a food plot and they're shooting a big buck, we're not living in Iowa land or Kansas, all these dream hunting lands. We're, we, most of you out there, just percentage of hunters, why well, Kansas has 25,000 bow hunters. Michigan's had over 400,000. So the odds that you're sitting out in Kansas watching this video, I'm not saying you're not. I know we have, we have people, even our seed that we've sold this year, in three and a half months, we sold seed to, over, to 43 states. So we reach out a long ways. States you would never even think there's no whitetail hunters there. But bottom line is, is that if you're watching someone sitting that blind and cable TV in the middle of a food plot, and you think you're gonna do that in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Minnesota, M most of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, we go all over to the East Coast, a lot of high pressure states, it's not gonna happen. Do the opposite of that, meaning put the blind, hide it off to the side, make sure you don't spook deer getting in and out of the stand. Magazines, you know, most magazine writers, there are some really good ones out there, but there are a lot. They interview for food plots. They interview for wild, for water holes. They interview for scrapes because they don't have the experience or very vast experience themselves to talk about it. So, and then on top of that, you know how many interviews I do for magazine articles? Not very many. I don't have time. Time is money. It doesn't You don't get paid a lot to be a magazine writer. So, have you ever heard of starving artist? Similar with magazine writers. I'm not knocking magazine articles, but it used to be... When you're reading something from Field and Stream back in the day in the 80s and 90s, 70s, those were the experts. Now they're relying on experts to interview, put them in the article for the most part, not all the time, but you're listening to someone that doesn't know that subject very well, or you're reading. They're interviewing people that they could find 
that had the time, and usually if you're successful in this industry, you don't have time. So you have to prioritize your time. I wish I had more time. It'd be fun to just interview magazine articles that you don't get paid for and spend two or three hours here and there. I don't have time for that. And so you have to look at where that source is coming from. But if you're learning from that, that could be a bad thing. Not a bad thing 20, 30 years ago, but it is more now. Science, if you listen to the science, science will tell you that bucks have a whole mi a range of three miles. Science will tell you a lot of things that don't apply to your hunting. Private land, pressured private land, pressured parcels anywhere that's fragmented, meaning 100 acres, 200 acres, 50 acres, 30 acres in the neighborhood. Science doesn't apply to that. You can fit more mature bucks in an area. Science will tell you if you see 200 deer on a property in February in Mississippi that you should shoot 50 deer a year. Six years later, you can't find any deer on your land. The problem is, is you need to go by October, November deer numbers. Science will tell you to take a deer census in August, September on your land. That only applies to fenced in properties, large commercial properties where the deer herds are controlled by size. Instead, that represents a pivot point where if you're doing a good job, your numbers could far exceed what those numbers are in August, September, and or they could go down if you're doing a really bad job. So either way, it could be higher or lower. And that goes to the DNR right here. You know, uh, someone close to me the other day, they were talking about, you know, it's a northern area public land, or not public land, big wooded area, and their food plot. The, the answer by the DNR officer, biologist, was say, oh, you know, there's, Food plot's not lasting. So the answer, right, is to shoot more deer. There's too many deer, right? No, wrong. Those deer are coming from two or three miles around. They're not representative of a, of a section of land, let alone 40 acres. They're eating all that food down to the dirt because they're coming from so far along. You start shooting does, you might be eliminating someone's deer herd from two miles away. Very irresponsible. If there's browse around that plot, pine spruce that are being eaten that aren't normally eaten in the area. It's because all those deer are congregating in one spot and eating because of the food plot. The answer isn't to shoot more does. Now you shoot does, you create a vacuum effect. You just have more does or you ruin your hunt. The answer is more food, better cover, more locations of food. You have to look at the whole complete picture and someone who's working typically, not all the time, there's always these exceptions, but typically if you're working for a state, you can't, you wouldn't be working for private individuals. If you're working for a federal entity, it's because that's what you went to school for and you're working there because you would make 10 times more if you're working for the private sector, typically, if you're good at what you do. Listen to the DNR, listen to science, magazines, cable TV, you're going to be on the wrong path right away. So just ignore it. Do the opposite of most of that recommendation. Plan every step. You plan for quality, unpressured cover and food, whether you're planning for that on public land or private land. Don't blame others. Know that you have a lot more control over your outcome than you would realize in any way. You know, don't be opposed to change, but plan every step. So once you have a plan of attack, plan it for every step of the way. If you're hunting public land, this is where I hunt in early October, middle of October, end of October. This is where I hunt in November. This is where I hunt during the rut. This is where I hunt when things slow down right after the rut. I'm focusing on these food and short movements where bucks don't want to move during the daylight. This is where I hunt in December when the second rut heats up. This is December hunts totally different in October because you're hunting more clear cuts, diversity of change, habitat change. So you're planning out this and then you're planning these stand locations along with access routes that don't bump those deer within those hot spots of food or cover. You're blowing your scent to the outside. Yes, I know a lot of planning, but on public land, you're scouting from your TV. You're scouting on your phone, your tablet, your device. So you're spending a lot of time just instead of reading a magazine, instead of watching some stupid show on TV or surfing the internet, looking at goofy videos, look at your maps, look at your aerial photos, plan your hunt. That's where I'm going to hunt, plan to. You could sit there and plan one hunt every two, three hours. <laughs> it's funny, as Dylan's showing me that's what he's doing right now. He could, Dylan, Dylan could care less what I'm saying. He's just... <laughs> I got to watch this again later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, unfortunately, he's got to listen to this a lot. But yeah, he's looking at South Dakota maps for next week, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so bottom line is, you can plan these hunts. But if you wait till October, you're, you're sunk. You're going to have another season that sucks. There's a lot you can do, so much you can do, and that's the great thing. Plan your private lands. Hey, they can come into this food source. They can come from two different directions. And those directions of bedding area, they could go over this to this food source. You can control that daylight movement. They don't need a lot of space during the daylight. They don't need three miles home range during the daylight. That's a joke. 
buck needs three or 400 yards. They need an acre to a cover. They need to go to this food source. And then at night, they go express their three mile home range. You don't care what happens at night, only during the day. Think about that as it relates to a private land. You can set the table of quality food and cover. You're not gonna do it with TSI. You're not gonna do it with controlled burns, native grass plantings in general. You're gonna do it by offering quality food, quality cover, and making sure you don't pressure them. Then everything else falls in. We have pollinator blends out here. We have 13, 14 acres of switchgrass. We have apple trees, we have cuttings, we have timber stand improvement. But the first things I did when I got here was put in and control quality food plots that related to interior bedding areas that I never even went and looked at. Didn't need to, just know the deer are gonna come from there. Good bedding on topography, I didn't even go scout it. Mock scrapes, stand locations, access, water holes. Those are the first two years. Water holes are the second. That's what I looked at the priority. Now we have more pheasants, rabbits, because we put in rabbit houses, lines of switchgrass for pheasants because the cover doesn't blow down during the winter time. You make smart choices on your habitat, which we talk about in other videos. Bottom line is we look at it like we can hunt this spot, we can hunt this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, and then, it's, then it boils down to sign. You know you have an effective way in and out without spooking them. You know you have, they relate to food and cover, so you can go in without spooking these deer. So the table is set for a great hunt months, months and months before it even begins. And you can do the same on public land before you ever step foot in the woods on public land. There's so much you can do. Public land, again, doesn't take a lot of work. Just sit in your couch, scout, and go verify. Develop a lot of choices, a lot of plans. Know that change is good. Find that unpressured food and cover. And you can always change, again, going back to the beginning, you can always change your deer season in one year, one off season. It doesn't even take a year. It takes an off season of proper planning and making sure that you hit the priorities first. You can always fill in the non-priorities later. We haven't pruned apple trees yet. That's coming. But pruning apple trees takes a lot of work and doesn't have anything to do with promoting more wildlife, let alone whitetails, and the way we hunt on our land. Pretty cool to do with the resources, but again, you have to probably, if you're like me, you don't have time to waste. Meaning you do everything first, you do your priorities first, and then it gets in these non-priorities, kind of like this. Look at everything like a big giant triangle. You do this first, this second, this third, water, you know, apple trees, pruning apple trees are down here. You go down, work on these priorities first. Targeted, dedicated. Doesn't matter if it's public or private land, you can change your hunt this off season. Don't be dismayed. We talk about our December deer hunting fails, things you can do different, but a lot of times it's doing the opposite of what you hear out there. Not necessarily online, but online especially cable TV, magazine, science, DNR. Do the opposite and you'll find success this year and beyond. Plan right now and you could have a great hunt for the rest of your life. I urge everyone out there to really check out my web classes. They've been wildly successful. We have one that details how you should design your land, another one that details how you should plant and maintain and manage a food plot program. How can you make those decisions that fit your land specifically and not someone else's? Unfortunately, there's so much information in the hunting industry that says you should do this, but it doesn't apply to you. These web classes directly apply to you. And then we have our third web class that came out last year, our rut web class, navigating the entire rut. And then we have our fourth one coming out, which is hunting hills and thermals. I urge you to check those out, try the web classes, and they're all about teaching, helping you understand how you can navigate, not only managing your property, food plots, and the rut, but also hunting, hunting strategically, hills, thermals, and wherever you pursue whitetails for your dream and your passion.